Good day, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, my name is Chosen Alcarende, and I am blessed to be ministering to you all um, on this very day on God's Word, on the theme of the month, or this series, I'd say, that PBC has. I want to thank the church for um, permitting me to be part of this ministry. I want to thank the pastor, the man of the house. Um, and all the others that are tuning in online, I pray that God will bless you through this message. We want to talk about, uh, or the key text is from Romans 6, uh, 12 to 20, and looking at slavery being inevitable. Slavery is inevitable. Um, that's the theme of this series. And who are you a slave to? That's a good question for us to ask ourselves who are you a slave to? Because we are all a slave of somebody. Um, as you might have already heard in certain sermons that have already been preached concerning this topic. And I just want to add to and actually go back a little bit um, on the key text and actually start from verse one. And then we work our way down. I'm not going to go through to verse 20. Um, there's not much time for that. Uh, maybe another time if that's permitted. But we just want to slow roast the word of God. All righty. Um, when when you have more than enough money and you go to a nice restaurant, you eat slowly. You don't just gobble up. Blah, 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 blah. That, that's that's not. No, the food is worth you slowing down and getting all the nutri uh, nutrients out of it. The word of God is greater than that. So when we read the word, we don't want to rush through the word. We want to, as Jesus would often teach, have the people sit down. Calm down. Tune everything else off. You might be watching online and multitasking. Hey, sometimes it's just it's good just to sit down and enjoy a good meal. And I pray that that will be your portion in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you once again for a time like this. Thank you for an opportunity to be alive, to be amongst the living. Lord, we're praying as we get into your word that your word will get into us. We pray that it goes deep in our hearts. We pray that it takes fruit, that it bears fruit. And please, Lord, let that fruit remain in Jesus name. Amen. So looking at Romans 6, the key text is from verse 12 to 20, but I just couldn't help it. But start at verse one, because when we read this and, and it really goes deep in our hearts, uh, our lives will be transformed. And that's my prayer for you uh, today. Romans 6 verse one. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. I, this whole teaching, I'm just going to be reading the word, adding a little comment here and there, just reading the simple word. Shall we continue in sin so that grace may increase? Some of the other versions say so that grace may abound. I'm reading the NASB 95, NASB 95. May, may it never be. How shall we, who are, who are the we here? It lets you know. How shall we, who died to sin, still live in it? How shall we, who died to sin, still live in it? And it's going to explain to you how we died to sin. And hopefully, I'm praying by the grace of God that you'll be part of that we. If you're not already part of us. Verse 3 says, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized. Now, that's the we now. Who've been baptized, how? Into Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his death. Therefore, because anytime you see a therefore, you want to find out what is therefore. So because we've been baptized into his death, therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. It's amazing to me how many people claim to be in Christ. But there's no night and day difference. I mean, he brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light. There's a difference between darkness and light. Obvious difference. There shouldn't have to be an investigation until like, let's look a little deeper. Perhaps we'll find a little bit of light. No, it should be obvious. Why? Because the Bible says light shines where? In darkness and darkness could not overpower it. Darkness could not comprehend it. 
Is that the testimony of your life that you are walking in the newness of life? The scripture says that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. Is there a newness of life that people could look at your life and testify? Better yet, before people look at your life, you look at your life. I, I, it seems like now, you know, Christians, we want to just blend in so well with the world and still claim Jesus. No. You read the Old Testament, God gave them a bunch of laws and rules for them to stand out, to be separate. And now we're not under law, we're under grace, but yet still the principle of separation still stands. What separates you from the world? If we dress like them in the immodest way, you speak like them with loose and foul language, go to the same places that they go that does not glorify God, where is the newness of life? Brethren, this is not something that you do. This is something that God does when you surrender to him. The Bible says, therefore, it is God who works in you, both to will and to do of what pleases him. We need to examine, is God working in me? If there's many dark spots in your life that no man can come and examine, that nobody can look at, brother, that's not God. Because the Bible says what? God is light and in him there is no darkness. So if God is at work in your life, there will be light in your life. Nothing will be hidden in your life. You will expose the deeds of darkness in your life. If God is at work in you, the scripture says about Jesus that the Son of God, the Son of God appeared for this purpose to take away sins. And in him, there is no sin. Is God at work in you? Is he taking away sins, habits, ways of living that you used to do? Is that being removed from you? If that's not your testimony, we need to re-examine. It's not the worst thing in the world. If you could acknowledge and repent, it's the worst thing in the world to understand and walk away like the rich young ruler did. Jesus came to him. The Bible says that he he ran to Jesus. He looked like a humble guy, knelt down before Jesus. The Bible says Jesus loved him. What, 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 a, what a saying. Jesus loved him. And you know what's interesting? The Bible says that Jesus is the word of God made flesh. The word of God, Jesus says concerning the word, he says, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. So Jesus loved this rich young ruler. Who said, hey, man, I've done everything since I was a youth. I'm good. Like, what, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? I've done all those things. Jesus said, hey, you lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have. Because remember, this guy said he's, he's kept all the commandments. You know, the first one was, hey, you, you won't have any other God before me, right? Jesus, all right, let's test that. Go sell all that you have. So make the money that you like to make. Give to the poor. Give it all away. And then come follow me. Empty. And that's how God wants all of us. It's the principle that we take. It's not the instruction that's always for everybody. The principle behind that is come to God empty so he can fill you. So whatever that thing that is that's holding you back, come to God empty. And, 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 and the scripture says he walked away sorrowful. He was sad. He walked away from life. He could have had a newness of life. He walked away. It wasn't the worst thing in the world that he didn't have eternal life at that point. The worst part was that he walked away from his opportunity. So if you're examining your life through the scriptures as we're reading it, and you're like, man, I ain't gonna lie, I really don't have a newness of life. I can't testify of that in the secret that I have a newness of life. My homeboys, my homegirls, they can't testify there's a newness of life. Okay, brother, sister, it's not the worst thing in the world. Don't walk away, though. Surrender. Obey the word of God. And Jesus says, whoever comes to him, he will no wise cast out. Don't walk away. Verse 5 says what? For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly... We shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Oh, it's getting good. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. 
All right. So you got to understand the Bible talks about Jesus as the second Adam, as the last Adam. When the first Adam ate of the fruit, you also ate because we were all in Adam. So when you come out, you come out as Adam became a sinner. He didn't do anything. That's how you came out. Look what the scripture says. It calls Jesus the second Adam now. Why? Because the first Adam, what he did, what he did affected everybody that will come after him. Likewise, what Jesus did, what he accomplished, would also affect everybody that comes after him. Everybody that's born again receives everything that Christ received. Everything that Christ was, you are in the sight of God. And I'm speaking of perfection, holy, righteous, blameless, because he is, so are we, if we are in him. But for you to be in him, you need to be born again. You need to see your sin, acknowledge your sin, repent and surrender all to Jesus Christ. Come to him empty. And he promises that he will fill you with his Holy Spirit. So I'm going to take that again. Verse five. Romans 6 verse 5, NASB 95. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, how is that? It will let you know. Certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified, how? With him. In order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is free from sin brother have you died this is what the scripture says if you've died with him if you've surrendered all to him if you've given everything to christ then guess what you have died with him and if you've died then you have you're freed from sin so we're gonna because the scripture is so practical right because it tells you you're free from sin but you're like i ain't gonna lie man i, I did all the surrendering i've done this i've done that but sometimes i'm still um you know, and other times, sometimes, you know, hey, we're going to get there now. All right. But just, just, just let's, let's walk together. Verse eight. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer has master over him. And you're going to see how death here is like death for Christ is sin for us. You're going to see how that connects. For the death that he died, all right, the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Consider yourself dead to sin that's when we get to verse 12 that it says therefore from all the things that we just heard therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey his lust and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness so it tells you what not to do but it tells you what to do but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. And verse 14 is where we'll stop. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are no longer, for you are not under the law, but under grace. The scripture says the law came by Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Grace has come, so you are no longer under the power of sin. The law could do nothing to help you. It just tell you you're wrong. It just tell you you can't do that. But it did not empower you to overcome sin. Now we have been given the power through Jesus Christ. So that verse 12 tells us, do, don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies. Don't obey its lust. Present your bodies as instruments of righteousness to God. How can we do that? What does that look like practically? There's a few scriptures that have helped me, and I wish I knew them earlier 
in my days. And I'm going to share two of them uh, 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 with you concerning how we can have this victory over sin. We already have the victory. Why? Because of the word. If the word says we have it, then we have it. Now, listen, going back to the analogy about the old Adam and the second Adam or the first Adam, second Adam. When you're born into sin, you live out what you are. You, you see it from little children. You, they just come out disobeying, selfish, arrogant, proud, uh, self-centered. They're living out what they actually are. Sinners. We have to teach them what is good, how to be good. You have to teach them that. Other stuff, you don't have to teach them. They just pick it up. You could be a perfect mom and dad. Whatever you give birth to is not going to be perfect. Because as the scripture says, in iniquity, I was shaped in my mother's womb. We all come out the same way. That's why salvation is for all. All must be born again. Nobody is born a saint. You got to be born again. Nobody had a perfect birth except for Christ. Because he came through the spirit of God. And that's how we are born again too. Through the spirit of God. So you're born. You live out what you are. You're a sinner. Guess what? You might do some good things. Doesn't change who you are. You're still a sinner. No matter how many good you do. Now in Christ. If you're born again. You also likewise live out that which you are. You're perfect in the sight of God. Live it out. You're righteous in the sight of God. Brother, live it out. You are holy in the sight of God. Live it out. And guess what? In this walk, if we're going to be real with ourselves, yeah, I might stumble a little bit. It doesn't change who you are. Because Jesus says he's the light of the world. Whoever follows him will not walk in darkness. You will not continue in darkness. If you're truly his, you have a repentant heart. If you ever slip up, you make a blunder. You, you know, have an outburst of anger. You lust after somebody. You will get things straight because his seed is in you. You cannot continue in sin. He won't let you. The spirit of God won't let you. I compare it to, you know, you know, there's there's somebody present doo doo to you on a nice plate, low, you know, expensive plate, give you fork and knife and everything. Can you eat it? Yes. It's possible. Will you? No. And somebody could present this thing in a way that doesn't look like doo doo. They change it up a little bit now. Okay. So you're like, wait a minute, this kind of look tasty. They take the smell away. But the moment you realize that, hey my G, somebody know, you know that's doo-doo, right? It's like, oh wait. Right away, your mind changes. You have a hatred for that thing. You want it to get away from you. Because you're not an animal. You're a human being, and human beings don't eat poop. You're a child of God, and sin is like doo-doo, all right? That's what you want. That, that's how far you want to grow in the Lord, that that's how you see sin. Like how? Like I always like to say, Genesis 39, 9. Joseph says, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Like, what in the world? How? And you know, there's a different way of seeing that same saying. When you're living in sin and you know you ought to be doing right, your mind will be telling you the same thing. Hey, how could I do this? How could I do this and sin against God? You're trying to find a way to actually do it. You're saying the same thing, but with a different mind. I hope and pray that you are not of that mind, that you are of the mind of, wait a minute, how in the world can I do this great wickedness? That's what sin is. Great wickedness and sin against God. Live before God. Joseph wasn't concerned about Potiphar. He said, I would be sinning against God. He's more important than Potiphar. Maybe Potiphar deserves me to sin against him. Maybe he's neglecting his wife. Maybe he's treating me wrongly. Maybe, you know what I mean? He deserves a little payback. We don't care about what man deserves. What does God require? He said, how could I do this and sin against God? I hope and pray that that is your attitude when you, when you are presented with sin. 
I hope and pray that if you slip and stumble and fall somewhere and you get acknowledgement of that, a brother comes and whispers in your ear, a sister lets you know that, hey, you hear a message? I pray that you have a repentant heart like David did. That you come to the Lord with weeping and tears and say, Lord, how did I do this? Forgive me, Lord. And the Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of just a few, un no, of all unrighteousness. You're not too far gone. God is calling you to come home. So how can we, who are dead to sin, continue to live in it? If you believe that, live that. Speak that. If you slip up, say it to yourself. How can I continue? Lord, please help me. And he will help you. Because that's one of his titles. He is a helper. And he'll help you in the time of need. There's a scripture. Oh boy, I'm looking at my time. Let me wrap it up. In this same Romans 13, 14. Ah, but we'll pull back a little bit. Let's start at Romans 13, verse 12. This is a scripture I wish I knew when I was younger. Probably would have helped me to live a better life for the Lord. Romans 13, verse 12. Because you might be wondering, how do I keep on messing up and getting back up, messing up? The scripture lets you know. Romans 13, verse, verse 12. 13, verse 12. The night has almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Amen. Why do you have so many secrets? Why do you have so many places you go that nobody knows? Hey. Put on the armor of light. The Bible says the way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what they'll stumble over. You don't know. If you're walking in darkness, I mean, turn off the light and walk around your house. If it's pitch dark, you don't know what you're going to stumble over. Walk in the light. Somebody stumble over, oh, they, they fall into sexual morality. Somebody is drugged. Somebody is angry. That leads them into some deep sin. Somebody, you don't know what it is. Walk in the light. What does that mean? Don't have any secrets in your life. Secret places you go. Secret friendships you have. Secret conversations you're having. Don't do that. Walk in the light also. In the sense of if you fall into something, confess. Not just confess. The Bible says confess and forsake. That's how you walk in the light. You bring that evil deed to the light. Say, Lord, this is what I've done. You go to your brother, your sister, your cousin, your auntie, your friend, your teacher, your neighbor, whoever it is. Say, please forgive me. That's how you walk in the light. It's a humbling thing and your flesh doesn't want to do it. But this is the call of God. Verse 12, again, the night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. What is this armor of light? Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus. Hold on. I thought I should put on armor of light. Hey, God is light. Put on the Lord Jesus. And what? And make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lust. There you go. Why do we keep slipping, falling, rising, slipping, falling, rising, slipping, falling, right? God wants to lead you into a life of victory. No longer slipping or falling, slipping or falling, slipping. Or falling. What is that? That's not the exercise of a believer. He wants you to overcome the way he overcame. And God can because all things are possible through him. And this is his will, your sanctification. Make no provisions for the flesh in regards to its lust. That's where I'm going to end this. We can ask ourselves, in which way are you making provisions? In which way are you making provisions for the flesh? You're... you're you have you have sin ready to go. Don't make any provisions. Who do you think you are? You're gonna slip and fall. No, nope. we had a little uh, uh, ice ice day in Houston. You know, 
snow came down. It was icy, right? Because it doesn't snow in Houston. But it was really icy. And I thought, I, you know, I thought I was pretty balanced. I thought I was good. I went out there like, I got this. The floor is icy. I, man, I almost bust my head thinking I could walk on ice. Who do you think you are? Nobody's built like that. Flee, the Bible says, every appearance of evil. And I love this scripture that tells you, put on the Lord Jesus. Hey, man, when, when you put some on, people see that before they see you. Better yet, people can't see you unless they see that. And people can't see that unless they see you. Is that the Lord Jesus in your life? Or do you kind of you know, put them to the side? Jesus, I ain't going to put you on today. I'm going to my boy house. I'm going to my friend. I'm going to my girl house. I'm going to just park. Now, when you're coming through, they should see lights coming. And to some extent, men may hate you because the Bible says men hate the light because their deeds are evil. But there's a place for men hating you. There's another place for people loving the light because Jesus was the light of the world. And yet still, sinners loved him and their lives were transformed. So there's a place for both. But brother, put on the Lord Jesus. Put on the armor of light. Let there be no darkness in your life. And make no provisions for the flesh. Let's, let's examine our lives. In which way are you making provisions for the flesh? In which ways am I making provisions for the flesh? You got to examine. Ask the Lord to show you. That brother, you keep slipping right here because you've made provisions for the flesh. Oh, that's making provision. Yes. You're, 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 pre you're prepping yourself to sin without knowing it indirectly. But if you believe what you've read in these scriptures, that you are dead with Christ, you've been raised with him to a newness of life. And such people, he fills them with his spirit. Such people put on the armor of light. Sin will not have dominion over them because they are no longer under the law, but under grace. I didn't get a chance to look at the text, but there's a text in Titus 2.12 that tells us about grace. That the grace of God has appeared to all men, bringing salvation to all men, teaching us. Grace teaches us to deny ungodliness. Grace empowers us to deny ungodliness. I want us to pray, go to the Lord ourselves, and ask him to help us. The Lord, please, your word is so challenging. The standard is so high, we can't match up. It's impossible if we're by ourselves. But your word says, but with you, all things, all things are possible. Lord, we know that this is your will, our sanctification, our growing in righteousness, our growing in right standing with you, becoming more and more like your beloved son. Lord, we're praying that you'll be merciful to us. That you'll fill us afresh with your spirit. Help us to live a life that's empowered by you. Help us, O oh Lord God, that sin will not have dominion over us. That we'll no longer be slaves to sin, but slaves to righteousness. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' name, amen.